Welcome back to the OPEX podcast where fitness is explained. I am your host as always, Robbie Burke, and I'm joined on today's show by Dr. Stuart McGill. On this episode, Stu and I cover a lot of topics, including what is new with Stu since we last spoke. We discuss topics around his book, Back Mechanic, and we also discuss topics around the book he done with Brian Carroll, The Gift of Injury. Towards the end of the show, I asked Stu about the top lessons he has learned since we last spoke. I asked Stu for his top and current book recommendations. I asked Stu if he only had one year left on earth, how would he spend that year and why? I asked Stu if there's any areas of research that he would still like to do or like to have done while he was still a professor. And finally, I asked Stu the big question. If he could invite five people to dinner, dead or alive, who would he invite and why? Guys, this is an absolutely outstanding episode with Stu. I know you're going to love it. Stay with us. Okay, Stu, we are recording. Thank you so much for making time to talk to me today. Take your time there. Uh, sip, sip your tea. There's no rush. <clears throat> well, good morning, Robbie. I guess it's afternoon for you in beautiful Dublin, but uh, there we are. I uh, I like the assumption you made that Dublin's beautiful. And, you know, in fairness, I will say we've had had a great summer, but today, would you believe, is like, I think we got like the remnants of that hurricane that hit the east coast of America because today has been so windy. I was walking in the park today and like th- two or three trees were knocked down. It was like unbelievable. You do not know wind or cold, sir. Oh, uh, I, I don't. And I don't want to swap. I don't, I don't, I don't want to swap <laughs> places. You're complaining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. As I said to you before we got on, you know, uh, 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 a human in a first world country, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I hit the lotto with the, with the family I, I got, so I'm. I'm I'm grateful for that. Uh, seriously, though, thanks for making time. Really do appreciate it. No one, the uh, nobody listens to this isn't going to know who you are. Absolute legend in the field. Um, obviously, you and that majestic mustache. But just you've you've retired since we last spoke. Um, so maybe just give us a catch up on what's new in the world of Stu McGill. Well, uh, I retired from the university two years ago, which means I don't do uh, the research that I once did in the clinic and in the uh, research lab. However, uh, I still really enjoy seeing uh, challenging patients. So I see uh, top athletes who fly in around the world whose performance is inhibited by back pain. And and my job is to restore their athleticism and uh, get them back onto the podium if possible. So that's a lot of fun. And I also see some very challenging uh, back pain cases and put on the odd uh, course. Are you doing much travel these days? Uh, I try not to. Mm. I'm, I'm really worn out with... Uh, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And it's not as fun as it used to be, um, just with more international restrictions and uh, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, I, I do, uh, having said that, I, I, I still travel, uh, hopefully for the right reasons. Uh, but yeah, that pretty much summarizes the travel. <laughs> uh, no, listen, I, uh, it's, it's a common sort of team. I see like, you know, the likes of like, you know, I'm good friends with Mike Boyle and, you know, even Mike's like a lot of, he, he does, a, he like, he kind of gives a lot of his traveling commitments to like Kevin Carr, like in terms of like, is there any certification courses and stuff as well? And even like speaking engagements and, and you know, Kevin actually does a lot of now in Germany for perform better, you know? So I, I see that too. And when you're traveling your whole life, obviously it's going to burn you out a bit. Same with Paul Check, like Paul's like, listen, like I've, I've been around the world about five times at this stage. I need to take a break. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, understand that 100% uh before we go on kind of on, on that scheme of traveling around how's your hip been because you, you didn't you have did you have hip surgery there a while back oh boy you've got a, <clears throat> a good memory well I've got some interesting stories about that <laughs> oh well it interests uh, me away sir yeah well I had my right hip replaced uh, about four years ago and uh I was one of uh the few who it was not successful on oh. uh where I, I think you know the basic procedure they drive a stem down your uh, titanium stem down the middle of your femur uh, to anchor the the ball and uh, I ended up getting what are called 
tip stresses. So right at the end of the prosthesis, about a third of the way down my thigh, I was getting tremendous bone pain. Mm. And I would get bone pain down my thigh if I walked up two flights of stairs. So, you know, I was becoming very, uh, I felt fragile. <laughs> I was becoming quite disabled with it. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't ride a bike. I couldn't squat much. It was, uh, you know, uh, just not what I had bargained for. But uh, what I've been doing recently, and this will sound very uh, odd to some people, but uh, if you're familiar with a thing called the Tesla coil, which looks basically like a big MRI machine, you know if you run a current around a coil, it creates a magnetic flux. Yeah. And uh, what they do is they oscillate that current in the coil two times a second, and that creates a changing magnetic flux. Sorry about that. That'll stop yeah, ringing. Yeah, sorry, sorry. But anyway, uh, what I think it has done is it has desensitized the bone pain, believe it or not. And uh, I feel uh, very resilient once again. I'm back riding a bike. And... Uh, so that that's that that's been amazing. On the other hip, <clears throat> I started stem cell therapy. Oh. Uh, I still have a reasonable articular surface on that one, and I have to say I'm feeling better now than I have for probably uh, 25 years. Do you know, it, it's go. it's so funny you bring that up because. There's a, a guy called Eric Marola. He's a, he's, a, he's a guy who does documentaries. And he, he's actually kind of famous for doing two documentaries on Dr. Brzezinski, who's like, you know, this one of these sort of pioneering cancer doctors down in Texas. Anyway, he's done another uh, documentary on what are called um, the God Cells. And it's about stem cell therapy. And he actually goes over to an Eastern European country. I'm not too sure which one it was. Again, was it Lithuania or one of those countries? Um. I'd have to check it out again. I, I feel very ignorant because when people always confuse Ireland with the UK, you know, we always get annoyed. And then like we do the same with the Eastern European countries. Yeah, one of those countries. Um, but well, he goes, oh, I get annoyed when people say, oh, you're American. Oh, uh, listen. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I never make that mistake. Either. Yeah, okay. I, I always just say to people, where are you from? Because the same thing happens with Kiwis and Aussies. You know, if, if yes. you call someone from New Zealand, Australia, and you're like, uh-oh. Uh, but same, obviously, then for the internationals, just never call an Irish person English. It won't go down well. Yeah. I, I don't really care, but some people really get uh, their knickers in a twist, as my, as my mother would say. But uh, this guy, Eric Marola, he's done a documentary on it. Now, I have to watch the documentary, but he has gone and got these stem cells, and he does it like for his whole for his total body life. He says it cost him $18,000. He did a podcast with Jason Ferruja, and he spoke about it. And he just like, you feel like you're literally back in your 20s again. Like So he was just like... That, that you know i'm kind of reading that book sapiens by harari that's probably where it's going to go like in the next 10 15 20 years because harari predicts that the next biggest thing in terms of consumerism like at the moment it's like technology with ipads and ipods and computers and whatnot and information he's like it's going to be longevity and anti-aging medicine like you know that's where the money's going to go next so well, uh, you look at the uh trends in medicine it's certainly going that way. When you look at the mega trends, you know, one of the big major trends is recognizing biological variability. In other words, medicine is now personalized. So if you're on chemotherapy for cancer, they will tune the chemical and the dosage to that individual's biology. And uh, another uh, mega trend is turning a person's body into their own pharmacy. And that's where stem cells and PRP and some of these treatments are getting their traction from. Uh, it's a matter now of getting your body to uh, uh, properly differentiate those stem cells, scaffold them in mm. to do what they want to do, so much better than, say, a replacement surgery uh, or something like that. But, uh, you know, it's so interesting, Robbie. I see some places in the world, some physical therapists are saying, oh, there's modalities. There, there's no room for them. And, and th there may not be for some mod modalities. But, you know, I just gave a, a case of a therapy to desensitize uh, bone pain. Uh, that, that was a modality that had a, a role to play for an individual. Mm. So look at medicine being individualized 
uh, you start to make these uh, advances. But anyway, isn't isn't it interesting how oh. factions of medicine are really progressing under both of those mega trends? Yeah, others seem to be regressing. Yeah, no, it's uh, it it is very exciting in one regard. It, it is going to bring up a lot of issues, though. I think in terms of you know, it could be ethical issues stepping forward, like in terms of like maybe they're kind of probably going to get to a stage where, you know, because again, they're regulating gene expression on and off and like things like maybe like, I don't know, you could only like nearly end up making super children and like really rich people going, can you make my child like the next like Tom Brady? Can you like, is there something you can do there genetically? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I understand that. But, um, you know, going back to, uh, well, okay, well, 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 we'll just leave it like that. That's, then. that's, that's our, that's our, <laughs> That's our, that's our Guinness discussion, as we were saying. Yeah, um, yeah great stuff, great stuff. But uh, and just another area, too, that's super cool is mitochondrial medicine. That's an area that I've been really interested in for the last while, so I definitely think that's an area that will explode. Because obviously epigenetics has been massive in the microbiome. Kind of epigenetics, microbiome, and neuroscience have been like the huge areas of sort of research over the last 10, 20 years where everyone's like looking for a lot of answers. And I think, as you know, the more, the more sort of answers we get, the more questions we end up with. It's like, damn it! More questions. I'm more confused now. Well, uh, getting back and, and giving this whole discussion some placement back to our world, it's so interesting. You've talked about gene expression, and I've talked about tuning the therapy to the individual. You know, when you think about what trainers have the ability to do, mm -hmm. you turn on genes and regulate them with exposure to stress. Those stresses that trainers use are exercise. Yeah. And uh, if you understand the mechanisms, you can now tune the changes in performance to that individual and create tremendous gains. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the analogy I often use is there's, there's thousands of car mechanics around the world, but how many of them can produce an F1 winning race car for a few years in a row? Mm -hmm. Only a handful out of all of those thousands and thousands of car mechanics. When you look at some of the trainers, how come I keep seeing the same faces of those athletes who are on the podium and who their trainers are? Well, I know success breeds success. I get that. Yeah. But are those super trainers who understand the biological variability among their athletes and they have the right tricks in their tool bag to pull out and get those uh, advantages to really express how to overcome some of the inherent disadvantages in uh, a particular athlete, whether it's a lack of strength and they, they uh, uh, overcome that with appropriate technique or tuning the elasticity of a joint instead of stretching it away, they might tune the elasticity to get better storage uh, mm. and recovery of elastic energy, better pulses, more snap, whatever it happens to yeah, be. Yeah. So anyway, that's my little take on bringing that whole uh, esoteric discussion down into the, uh, the, the applied world and, and the super potential of those trainers who've truly become masters of their craft. Yeah, love it, love it. So Stu, since we last spoke, you brought out two additional books, Back Mechanic and Gift of Injury. So with Back Mechanic, it was more written towards your general population person to kind of take control of their back pain. So maybe just get into why you felt the need for this book and we can maybe discuss a few topics around it, if that's okay. Yes. Well, uh, just to give that discussion placement, I in a million years never thought I would write a book for the lay public. I was always writing for the clinicians and the professionals. Yeah. Um, but the public uh, I kept getting messages saying, you know, I read your clinical textbook, Low Back Disorders. It was a really tough read, but I learned a lot. Why don't you write a book for us, the lay public? And I, I never thought I would. However, I was talked into it and encouraged by these people. So a back mechanic written for the lay public with back pain, it was the hardest book I ever wrote. So yeah. People read it and say, well, it was a very simple, well laid out book, but it was so difficult for me to find the balance between scientific and medical truth versus making it uh, 
applicable. Mm. And uh, I, I hope I, I reached the, the proper uh, balance in all of that. So let's take the average person with back pain. They wait for a while, they get an appointment with a medic or whatever the form of clinician is, and they might get 10 minutes. During that 10 minutes, they do not get a thorough assessment or examination so the clinician tells them this is the mechanism of your pain and without understanding the mechanism they shoot in the dark and say oh here well here's some pain pills or you know here's a an exercise do this a mckenzie extension or whatever it is well as it turns out that might be an appropriate approach for one person it causes the problem uh, to get worse in the next so realizing this uh, the book starts by guiding the reader through a self-assessment of their pain triggers. Mm -hmm. So for the first time, they really begin to understand what activities, what motions, what postures, what loads cause their back pain to get worse. The corollary or opposite of that is what exercises, what motions, what postures and loads are very tolerable. Great, that goes a long way in showing us what the mechanism is. Now we're into the world, okay, if bending forward and tying your shoe uh, picks the scab a little bit in your back, so to speak, we're going to stand, do a lunge, move your hips towards your, your, your uh, uh, shoe and tie it that way, avoiding your particular back trigger. Or it might be the opposite bending backwards and extending might be your, your back pain and yet you golf or you um, uh, do things a certain way to exacerbate that particular pain trigger. Well, let's create a hack, a movement hack around that and allow that particular pain trigger to settle. Then a few more tests will reveal what is your body lacking? Why is it not tolerable to that load? Now let's build a foundation for you to become robust and pain-free so we will overcome that insensitivity in the future. So that's really what the book was all about. And uh, if you read the reviews on Amazon, for example, I think most people are finding uh, it helpful. Now, can you cure every various type of back pain? The answer is no, of course not. But uh, when we do follow up with people, uh, I can give you this statistic because we've measured this. Of all of those people who've told, been told they need back surgery, we get 95% of them to avoid surgery and they're happy that they did by following the approach. Not 100%, but 95% of those who've been told surgery is the last answer. And that actually segues nicely into the next question was your thoughts on surgery because you have a section in the book on surgery and you, your, your sort of closing thoughts in that section was that you encourage the, the person to kind of challenge the status quo in terms of like not sort of surrendering, surrendering straight away to oh, surgery is my only option here. So maybe could you just um, expand on that a little more for us? Well, absolutely. Uh, I think it should be illegal that a surgeon would operate on someone's back without proving first that they're going to cut the pain out with their knife. Mm. So what I mean by that is you might look at an MRI image and see a very nasty looking L4 disc. Well, it just might turn out that it was actually the disc above that's causing the pain, the one that's now taking all the movement responsibility and the one that's been damaged 15 years ago and looks horrible on an MRI. All the pain is burned out. It's stiffened. It's stabilized. It's not the painful one anymore. Or you might be getting a buzz in your right toe, right big toe. Well, that's the L5 nerve root. Mm. If the surgeon doesn't confirm that what they're doing is on L5, to match the pain, the chance of that surgery being successful is now greatly compromised. So um, again, very, very few surgeons will go through appropriate provocative testing to make damn sure that the thing, the anatomy that they're going to alter is going to take that person's pain away. If the surgeon suggests multi-level procedures. This is another red flag. It's the, the, the chance for success starts to really drop when, when we, we, we measure that. The corollary of all of this is when you measure the mechanism of why surgery is successful. Mm. 
think of what happens. The person is operated on and they rest. It is a forced rest. And then they recover very scientifically exactly how we would adapt tissue. The first day they get out of bed, go to the toilet, rest, and, and slowly build up uh, small exposures to load. And hopefully that adapts the tissues, or it, it's called healing, but what they're really mm. doing is adapting tissues to loads. Well, let's play a game called virtual surgery. If you've been told you need surgery, I'm going to make a big deal of it. I'm going to touch you on the head and say, there you are. I bestow upon you a fusion or whatever the, the surgery is. Now, I want you to behave as if the surgery actually happened. Mm. Because the person might say, she might be a, uh, a 35 year old woman who says, you know, I have to go to the gym every day and ride the uh, elliptical trainer for 20 minutes. Otherwise, I'll go crazy. You know, it's my mental release. And I say, well, really good. I hope you enjoy your pain. Um, but uh, if you won't be doing that, if you have surgery, so let's just play that game virtually. We're going to do that. It's going to cause you to have forced rest. And then we're going to build you back, build the mechanical foundation for you to support load and adapt tissue appropriately. You can either adapt it for mobility, you can adapt it for strength. You can't have too much of both. You've got to choose which way you're going to bias that. But nonetheless, we're going to create a plan and stick to it. Robbie, 95% of those people who follow our virtual surgery plan avoid surgery. I don't. I don't believe you. You're lying, Stu. I. I. We've. We. Fought. So, when I was a professor, uh, I was a professor for thirty years and two years as a research associate before that. So, thirty-two years. Every patient we ever saw at the university, we followed up with. We know exactly how they presented, what their pains were, uh, how they were a year later, wow. what we gave them to do, whether they complied their personality type, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I can stand by that figure exactly. I know exactly the number who got better following that plan. That's great stuff. Stu, just a, a question I want to ask too. Um, I'm going to ask you about assessments and, and other mediating factors of lifestyle as well. But before I get into that, I just want to make sure I ask this question. What are your thoughts on movement variability and like i don't want to have a big we're not gonna have an argument but i don't like i i, I want to make sure i'm being clear here on this so i'm not talking about like you know i've seen things where people are like you know you need to be able to train in bad angles and blah blah blah, blah. but i'm kind of more asking like you know where is in your mind where is that sort of balance on the spectrum of like right your spine doesn't and i suppose it's different areas of spine lumbar versus thoracic versus cervical we know that too but just when you hear the term movement variability and spinal spinal health, like what sort of message do you would you like to be very clear on to the masses on that? Well, the, the answer, of course, is it depends. Mm. So you know, if if you said to me, let's not talk about back pain or the spine, but let's talk about the leg, and just answer the say the question once again, but don't use the word spine. Use the word leg. Oh, here's a person with leg pain. Um, should they have movement variability? And you see the whole discussion changes. So let's first of all establish the scientific. Uh, code that the body must live by. So the leg and the hip, the hip is a ball and socket joint. The science will prove that that hip has very uh, high mobility. It has a huge neutral zone. There's no stress in the hip until you push it up to the very end range mm. and collagenous and bony stops come into play. But the disc of the spine is not a ball and socket joint. Yeah. It is a collection of collagen fibers adhered together around a pressure, uh, pressurized gel in the middle. In other words, it is, falls into the category, the mechanical category of an adaptable fabric. So an adaptable fabric has robustness and can tolerate variability only under conditions. Mm -hmm. so let's take a person now who wants to be a yoga master fabulous. They can bend their spine around, have all kinds of mobility because they 
Because of the mobility exposure, they loosen the collagen to create the mobility in that fabric. But if I ask that person to deadlift 200 kilos, they have a real problem now because with all of that mobility, they now need a lot of stability. They'll need an awful lot of uh, muscle activity to stiffen that hypermobile uh, fabric. And uh, a, a hypermobile fabric doesn't take very much load mm. before the pressure within starts to push through and delaminate the collagen fibers. Now, the polar opposite of that kind of adaptation would be a world-class power lifter. And, and as you know, I'm not talking through my hat here because we've, rebu we've rebuilt several champions. Uh, so we, we have uh, some on the floor uh, validity, content validity in this if, if we want to take it to the level of proof. So uh, a power lifter can't have a lot of mobility in the collagen of the fabric of the discs because the pressures are enormous. You know, we've, we've, we've worked with guys who have the highest Wilk score of all time, the biggest bench, deadlift, and uh, squat of any human on earth. We know how to build that and adapt that kind of a disc. More mobility would, 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 would not help them. In fact, it would cause it to succumb. Mm. So there's two polar opposites. Now let's take a gymnast, for example. A gymnast, typically, the ones who are very successful, don't lift a lot of heavy weights. They don't do Olympic lifting. They handle their body weight. So again, in terms of adapting the spine, handling their body weight, getting tremendous mobility and speed, it's wonderful. But you're, you're tickling the dragon's tail a little bit, and it requires some good coaching. Um, when we look at a jujitsu master in MMA, Typically, they are boa constrictors. They have fabulous hip athleticism, wonderful spine mobility, but they're not the big, strong guys. Mm. When and when you measure them, they don't kill you with their strength. They do it all with angles and techniques. It's a science. Where, and if you get a jujitsu master, and again, I'm not talking through my hat. I worked with absolutely the world's best and I know what they must do to train. And if they violate the biological code and get too much strength, um, those discs that allow them to be fabulous jujitsu masters um, won't tolerate a uh, heavy load. And then you get the other guys, the, the wrestlers and the stand-up bangers who can be quite a bit stronger. Again, it's, it's slightly uh, different training. So does that give a little bit of perspective on this whole issue yeah. of variability? It needs a context, mm. and the, the master of the craft will seek that variability appropriate to become the uh, athlete that they need to meet the demands of the sport, but you can't violate it too much one yeah. way or the other. And, and that's what the people on Facebook who get educated on Facebook and haven't worked with world champions, they don't get it. And they want to say, oh, yeah. my says, you know, brace them up and there's no mobility or the next guy says, oh, we'll work with this, this guy. And, and, and they've never worked with us. They have no yeah. bloody idea. And yet they want to get into Facebook discussions. So anyway, the, the, there's the spectrum and, you know, it's a really, it, it depends kind of question. Yeah. It's a, that's a phenomenal answer. And uh, like the, the key there is, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about the context, definitely all about the context. And, Sort of like what, what comes to my mind there is, listen, th there's no free lunches when it comes to elite performance and th that there's going to be trade-offs. So like kind of the question in my mind is, say with a world-class powerlifter, like is his spine going to be the healthiest spine ever in terms of longevity just for general health and wellness of life? No, but is it, is, it, is, it the, is it the spine that it needs to be for the sport that they want to be a master in? Absolutely. And even if you look at intra-individual differences in a sport, like for instance, the spinal requirements of a prop and a front row and rugby is very different to the winger who's more of a, like almost, <laughs> almost a track and field athlete. You know what I mean? I, I know exactly what you mean because I've worked with those teams as well. They're totally different biological animals. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly how I describe it. Totally different animals altogether. Could, could, you, could you take a, a St. Bernard and train it to win at the Greyhound track? <laughs> that's a brilliant analogy. 
Oh, uh, but if you if you were doing that, you'd be making millions. So I don't think that's happening anytime soon. Yeah. Great analogy, Sue. Great analogy. But you know, you, you talked about power lifters there. And once again, there's discussions within discussions here. And I, I wish I could really mention names. But of course, I'm, uh, you know, with confidentiality agreements and whatnot. I'm, Go I'm, on, I'm, drop, drop a name. Too. Well, I'm, no, but I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, and uh, this person I'm going to mention is, you know, quite well known. He's a fabulous coach. Uh, he's done it. So the proof is in the pudding. And, and we've talked about these things and we, we've also done it publicly. So I don't think he'd mind me, me mentioning this. Yeah. Um, but you take a guy like Marty Gallagher, who's uh, a coach, he's trained, you know, uh, Karvowski, Ed Cohn, um, you know, some of the top, top power lifters of all time. Marty himself, he, he's older than I am. Marty's in his uh, late 60s now. Wow. Do you know he's deadlifted 500 pounds off the floor in, I believe it's five decades. Five decades. He, he's oh he's done that over five he's decades. Right? Five hundred pounds off the ground for five decades. His spine is bulletproof. Yeah, yeah. So, you know when people say oh powerlifting may not uh, give you the the best spine for the rest of your life. I mean Marty is a man of steel. He's he, you know he was in a terrible car wreck a few years ago. He, 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 well, he walked away from. He was tougher than the car was. <laughs> so you know, and then of course. Uh, when I look at some of the other powerlifting spines uh, that we've uh, restored, uh, some, uh, they, they've been through a lot, massive fractures, uh, massive disc herniations, and, which are all evidenced on MRI images, uh, and we correlate that that truly is the cause of their pain and disability. But with appropriate training, Robbie, you can adapt those tissues to change shape and form back to somewhat of a normality. In other words, appropriate training makes the anatomy appear better yeah. after time. And this is a message, again, that people don't seem to get. They, 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 they don't listen to podcasts like this. You're asking questions where we're really getting into some meaty issues. They're not sound bites on mm -hmm. Instagram or Facebook. Um, you know, I, I, I wish I could hold up some of the before and after MRIs and the power of appropriate training to remodel tissue. I think the key word there again is appropriate, you know, appropriate training, because I know a big thing with your rehab with Brian Carroll, and we'll probably touch on this a little bit later if we have time was, you know, the recovery periods in between, you know, exposures of a spine to certain loads. Because I think b before he came to you and sort of, I think, again, you can correct me on this, but I think one of the, the causing mechanisms that you sort of concluded was that he was just, the, the, the time curves between him loading his spine and reloading his spine, they were just too close together to allow appropriate adaptation in between exposures to loads. And over time they cause like micro fractures in the spine, like where, and obviously that's going to be, there's going to be different timelines for different individuals in terms of obviously just going to be genetics and then, uh, you know, training level and status in terms of how often they can load that spine. But it, it is a common thing. You see that with the, like with the re, like again, bigger, stronger, faster more explosive human beings they do cause more homeostatic disruption every time they, they they basically output some sort of biological output you know force or whatnot so that they their recovery does take longer hence why i suppose a lot of the top 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 athletes over over the many years took drugs you know because it was a recovery thing um but yeah i mean that's something that's something we, we can touch on in a, in a few minutes um well, can you make a comment on that yeah of course of course can you um, because this is where, you know, I'll get a bodybuilder uh, who uh, is coming as a back pain patient and uh, they're, they're switching over to strength now, powerlifting or something mm -hmm. like that. But they continue a bodybuilding program or regimen and they wonder why they're A, not doing well in powerlifting and B, they're getting hurt. Yeah. And what they never realized was, the Frequency. Whole, yes, exactly. The whole 
uh, tissue adaptation objective has now changed. When they were bodybuilding, it was entirely focused on hypertrophying muscle. Mm. But a power lifter, if you do that, you won't be a good one because power lifting requires strong bone. You've yeah. got to build a skeletal foundation. If you want to squat 1,200 pounds, you need, I mean, that's crushing. Think of it. Uh, you know, I, if I get under a couple hundred pounds, that's, that's enough of a crush load to, to wake you up and educate you. But here's the thing. You can uh, uh, train, tear down muscle. That's why we train. We train to create appropriate adaptation. So they train to uh, tear down muscle, and it's about a two-day uh, turnover, and you can enhance this with drugs and all this kind of stuff. We know all that. Mm. But a power lifter, and you mentioned Brian Carroll, who had uh, a massive uh, sacral compressive fracture when he came to see him, and when he came to see me, and what I realized was we had to rebuild the bone before he ever got the capacity to train again. Well, to rebuild bone, it's not bodybuilding and a, you know, a train a day, a day off, and then uh, you train again. That will make bone worse. Bone is a much longer turnover cycle. It's about a five-day cycle. Yeah. So again, the master trainers and the masters of the craft know this. So what we did with Brian for bone callusing and refill in that huge fracture and deficit in, in his load bearing ability was he would train very mildly because that obviously you, you can't put much load on, on such a massive injury and then take five days off, move well, good spine hygiene, and then have the fortitude and the professionalism to do it for a year. Well, he cheated on me. He didn't do a full year, but, but the good part of a year and he was a good old pro he refilled in the bone. That 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 sacrum looks magnificent these days. Mm, mm. And and he, he came back to put on some magnificent performances after after that. But what a what what a great line. That that sacrum is magnificent these days. <laughs> I could just I could just, I, I could just see you I could, I, could, <laughs> I could just see you and Brian like when you're on a phone call, you know, like so Brian rings and how he's doing it. How's the sacrum? Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> oh, I, I, I had an athlete this morning and I was telling him what, that's the most fi fabulous collagen I've ever seen. <laughs> We're going to use that. <laughs> He's like, you're easily amused, doc. You're easily amused. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Um, but just, just before actually we get a little more into the story of Brian, because this is a fascinating story. Just finishing up with back, mecha back mechanic, you uh, put some self-assessments in there. Could you maybe just share some of these self-assessments with the listeners? I know it can be hard maybe to visualize, but maybe just give people a, a, some sort of idea if you can. Okay. Well, if a person has, is able to name certain activities that causes their back pain, if they said, you know, walking takes my back pain away, sitting makes it worse, or it might be the opposite, I don't know. Hmm. Or uh, something like that. We just proved that certain postures and certain loads cause their pain. So let's take uh, pain from compressive load. Okay, sit in a chair. Sit upright. Grab the seat pan of the chair and pull up. That will compress your back. Mm. Most people will say, no, that doesn't cause my symptom. I'll say, good. Slouch right down. Now, oh, they say, oh, yeah, there's my pain. So there's an example in compression of a test that just showed them and proved to them that that particular posture was driving their, their pain. So if they avoid that posture, uh, they will allow that pain to desensitize. Let's take, uh, let's see now, um, that, that would be a bending and compression test. Um, if I asked you to stand, now put a pocketbook under your right heel. Stand there for 10 minutes. Did that create back pain? I just proved once again that uh, not a load, but a posture caused your pain. Now stand there, hold a very modest kettlebell against your chest. Don't move. Outstretch your arms out in front of you. So now there's no posture change in this one. All I'm doing is adding compressive load to your back. So do you see how with different tests you can probe and hone in very precisely the combination of shear loads, 
posture, compressive loads, bending loads, twisting loads, etc. So let's say you found a person who wasn't tolerable to shear load. So compressive load is up and down your spine, shear is front to back. If a person had shear load intolerance, would a trainer say, okay, well, do, here, do some stabilization exercise. Now, your standing stabilization exercise is going to be a paloff press. Do, everyone knows what that is. You mm -hmm. stand beside a cable stack. You hold the cable, which is going off to the left-hand side or the right-hand side, and you slowly outstretch your hands, and you try and resist the movement. When you think about it, that creates a shear load. So if they don't pass the shear load test, you can almost guarantee that the paloff is going to tear them down and make them more painful. Mm. Now, if you said, let's replace the paloff because we know you're shear triggered, let's do a suitcase carry with the kettlebell. Do you see how there's no shear load? It's yep. a three point bend. Perfect. We just honed in on the perfect exercise that's tolerable and is going to build you versus tearing you down. So that's, that's the magic of it all, to show the person very precisely their pain triggers. Now you have a roadmap and a very precise guide. These exercises are not for you. These ones are. But the next person who comes in and, 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 and experiences different pain triggers uh, they they may very well do a pal off. So, you know, it irritates me when I hear people say, oh, McGill doesn't like this exercise. Well, I didn't like it for that one individual. It's context again. It's all context, of course. It's all, that's what every, Mike, you're friends with Mike, Mike Boyle. Mike and I just wrote an article together uh, a few months ago because a few years ago, and this was at a Perform Better meeting, I said, uh, you know, I've just had several athletes come in who now have pelvic ring instability, true sacroiliac pain because they've done too many split lunges. Mm. And uh, someone said, well, Mike Boyle told us to do it. And I said, no, he didn't. Mike Boyle said, do split lunges, but don't, uh, you know, hold the load close to you. Don't have a huge split between the two feet. Don't stress your pelvis. Don't do high volume of training with, with big loads. That's what Mike said. It was all context once again. So Mike and I, we, we got together just to write the clarification. You know, every exercise is, is a tool and you can cross the biological tipping point with any exercise or tool. Folks, you've got to use some common sense here. Yeah, exactly. The difference between medicine and poison is dosage. I mean, you can kill yourself drinking water for Christ's sake. But uh, just, I know Mike will end up listening to this podcast and, and he'll, he'll, he'll be, he'll laugh at this now. Uh, it's, it's rear foot elevated split squats too. He's, there's, no, there's no such thing as a split lunge. He'll tell you that. I will stand corrected. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> he he absolutely hates when people say um static lunges he's like because a, a lunge means that you're either stepping forward backside he's like whereas he's a static lunge to him is a split squat and no hates, but look my, mike's a master trainer and, oh i know that i know that but he hates of course he's allowed to say that and he's done the work to earn that opinion yeah absolutely so mike there i hope you're happy i i put that in for you um just before we move on from back mechanic uh just other mediating factors to lifestyle factors outside of um looking just at sort of the the main causative factors of the back pain like the biomechanical factors how much um when you are dealing with people how much do you kind of stress them the importance of nutrition and um, sleep and um, just general life stressors in their rehab well, again, that's an it depends kind of question. I always ask them, how are you sleeping? And uh, if they say, you know, I get out of bed in the morning, and that's the worst time of day for my back. I then do follow up questions on, well, what are you sleeping on? Have you ever mm -hmm. slept in a, in a hotel or another bed and you got up in the morning and you felt better? And is it because your, your, your mattress is worn out? Uh, it causes you to slouch and if we've just proven that that slouchy curvature just triggers your back pain, we're starting to get a handle on why. Or here, here's a, a, an interesting uh, feature. You know, some people say, oh, well, I love the uh, memory foam. Uh, what do they call them? 
mattresses. And uh, I said, well, yeah. And it turns out it's a heavy guy who lays on his back and snores. And his wife's sitting there beside him. Yep, he snores and he sleeps on his back. Because when you get into a memory foam mattress, that, that type of personality and body type will sleep very well. But you'll notice when they roll over, and again, we studied this, they have to roll up out of the depression in the memory foam. They wake themselves up. It's a lot of mechanical work. Mm. Whereas a person who's a side sleeper and more of a modestly built person, they would uh, not do well on a memory foam. They would uh, usually do well with a firm foundation and a very generous pillow top. Uh, so again, we, we measure these kinds of things and there would be a little bit of a discussion on uh, sleep. Uh, if, if they're obviously just with their appearance, their, their nutrition is out of whack and they want to know what I can do about back pain. Yes, I'll mention it. But if, if they ask me about, you know, uh, a very offbeat little supplement, what's my opinion and they're moving poorly and they're just yeah. in pain, then I'll just say, look, let's get the big stuff. Yeah big picture things right. And, and whenever I, uh, uh, as you may or may not know, I, I write a report once I've uh, seen a person back to their referring uh, clinician and I prioritize the uh, interventions. And uh, usually if it's a, a question about a supplement or a drug, that, that's lower down mm, of course. the uh, prior hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I hope that answers it. Do I ignore it? Absolutely not. But, uh, you know, I can think of the odd case where uh, these factors were very important, yeah. but uh, in most it's, it's farther down in terms of priority. So, uh, just before we want to, that's just, uh, I do want to ask you about sleeping positions and postures. Do, do, do you do a lot of education on that? Cause it is one area that for a long time, I never heard really people talk much about. And lately uh, I hear more and more people talk about like, you know, your sleep and posture in, in terms of, you know, your, your spinal health. Well, again, the answer is it depends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we will do provocative tests. We'll try and understand the mechanism of their pain. Uh, but then I, uh, and of course it starts with an interview and what are your common sleeping postures and what causes pain and, and do you ever get a sharp pain when you roll over in bed, which is a good sign that there's spine joint instability, for example. Um, but uh, I, I will then try and take their pain away. So let's use a specific example of a person who has back pain when they sit. The longer they sit, the more back pain they get. Their foot goes numb. In other words, we're dealing with a disc bulge that grows as they sit, but shrinks as they stand up and walk. And again, we, we measure this, uh, the, this mechanism. It's an open fissured uh, disc bulge. I will then lay them down on the uh, treatment plinth on their tummy. And uh, I might add traction, I might bend their knees, I might ask them to say, or they'll, they'll say, oh no, th this is hurting my back. I say, really? Push your eyebrow down into the mattress one kilo. Oh, doc, you just took my pain away. No, I didn't. I just added a little anterior chain stiffness and we took out the mechanism of your pain and uh, they're off to the races. So anyway, that, that we, we play jazz. We, we play with their backs and different sleeping postures and, and know enough about their back from other tests to give them a fairly solid strategy on, on how to sleep. And, uh. All right, I want you to, to attack this question because this is one that <laughs> there's just so much talk about. What is the story with hips? Because there's some people saying, oh, this whole thing of the you know, different hip anatomy and p some people should squat and some people shouldn't squat. There's some people saying that that's a load of crap, you know, that everyone should be able to do some type of squatting. And then, you know, there's a lot of people saying, no, 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 some people really should never squat because the hip anatomy and la, 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 and this, that. So clear up this whole hip confusion thing. All right. Well, it's a, it's a little bit of a lecture, but let me start with this. Uh, if they don't think hips matter, what they should do is follow orthopedic disease incidents. Mm. So let's take uh, hip dysplasia, which is associated with having a shallow hip socket. Uh, you know, if your dog has hip dysplasia, they've got a shallow hip socket. The highest rate 
of hip dysplasia in Europe is Poland. When you go through the anatomy, uh, you'll find that poles are the epicenter of the shallowest hip sockets. Uh, the Japanese, for example, are, are another uh, gene pool that have a very high incidence of uh, hip dysplasia, um, but they also have a very shallow hip socket. Now, when you look at some Japanese martial arts and karate, it takes advantage of great hip motion because of that uh, architecture. Now, where do the Olympic lifters come from in Europe? Eastern Europe. Bingo bongo. So that when you measure the power production of a shallow socket hip going into a deep squat, so you've just caught the bar in a snatch. Yeah. The power production out of the hole is very high. Yeah. Now I'm going to take a deep socket and you'll find the power production is very, very poor. Mm. Those lifters, when you set them up in a deadlift, you will find that when they're, where's their failure point? That will reveal a lot as well. If their failure point is lifting from the floor, they use their back now instead of their hips. Their power production is very poor and they fail off the floor. But if they can get the bar moving off the floor, they hit second gear as the bar slides past their knees. Yeah. Those are the deep socketed hip joints and they don't fail at lockout. No siree, they fail off the floor. So who am I talking about now? What part of Europe has the highest incidence of FAI, femoral acetabular impingement? Uh, I think Ireland is one of them. Yes, it's Ireland and Scotland yeah. and, and Normandy, France. Now I just named the Celtic nation. Yeah. So the gene, now does every Celt have a deep hip socket? No, of course not. I'm only talking about yeah. a, a genetic average. So the power production throughout the, the, the squat range is very different between those two types of hip architectures. So is the orthopedic disease. Are you going to train the two the same? I suggest a, you won't get the athletic performance, and B, you will create uh, either premature orthopedic disease. Uh, but uh, anyway, we can, we can go into that. What, Rob, you might be interested in, when I was a young professor 30 years ago, I was uh, called as an expert witness on two murder cases. <sighs> okay. What's a fine guy doing on a murder case? But nonetheless, the other person on our uh, medical expert team, she was a forensic anthropologist. Now, think back 30 years ago, there was no DNA evidence or anything, and her job was to identify the ethnic origin of the body and there was no hair or skin on it or anything like that. And she did it by looking at hip architecture, spine architecture, pelvic architecture. And every time she said, well, this feature is common in this part of the world. Well, I'm a bit of a martial arts and sports buff. And when you study the martial arts around the world, they're there for a reason. They yeah. take advantage of that particular gene pools, joint type, body type, et cetera. And they take advantage, a disadvantage of their opponents. So if you look at Okinawan karate, the Okinawans are the tallest people when they sit down and the shortest when they stand up. For example, they've got the longest body to leg length ratio. The, the polar opposite of, that, uh, opposite of that would be the Zulu nation of Africa. Mm -hmm. Look at their martial arts with the sticks and the jumps and whatnot to perfectly take advantage of, of that particular architecture, if you, if you know what I mean by that. So every time she showed me a feature of the um, anatomy, my brain would go to, wow, that's why Olympic lifters come from Poland, or that's why, you know, uh, the FAI is, is so prevalent in this, this part of the world. It's a very deep hip socket. I, I get that. And she said, well, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a Celtic hip. That, that, that's, that wouldn't be, say, a Dalmatian hip from the coast of Croatia. <laughs> you know, it really got down to that level. So that was my education 30 years ago. And uh, when, you, when you follow disease incidents, you'll, you'll see it. And uh, also you'll see it in um, abilities. But I, I should, if I may, finish off with this final thought on that whole area. It matters to me not let one little bit 
where the gene pool came from in the person who's in front of me mm. because there's always exceptions what you do is you do an assessment yeah and, you, and, and that assessment will reveal quite often the mechanism of pain the training whether it was appropriate or inappropriate and what you must do to restore pain-free ability for that person yeah. so yeah to become a master of the craft you you should know this stuff Great stuff. And a mentor of mine, James Cedrill, says assessment should be truth. It should lead you to the truth, a good assessment. But uh, Well, that's, uh, of course. Um, in terms then of assessing the hip, you know, you, you like to do that hip scour test. Is that one of them? And then also you used to do one years ago on all fours where you used to get people to rock back. But that was more so about like kind of squat depth in terms of where their lumbar spine started to go. But it's, it's more the hip scour test is what you usually used to, is it? No, I use many tests. <laughs> Very zen, no. The master uses many. So what else do you use there, Sue? Well, it all depends on the person. Okay, Uh, okay. If they have actual hip pain, I will keep probing the hip with, uh, you know, hip uh, forces to, of course, you don't want to dislocate it, but Mm. you try dislocation, compression. Uh, I test the hip labrum. I test the hip capsule, Mm. uh, the uh, neural uh, sensitivities, uh, femoral uh, roots are in front, uh, sciatic roots posteriorly. Uh, there may be a piriformis component. Uh, I'll, you know, it, it never ends. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When I have a patient in front of me who's difficult, I mean, you know, a, a, an orthopedic assessment to me that includes full neurology, anatomy, personality, learning style, that's three hours. Mm-hmm. okay uh, just uh, wrapping up here um i i do want to touch a little bit on the brian carl story i know we touched on it but it is a fascinating story and uh, and i uh, you know kind of today like when i was walking around and thinking about our conversation we we're going to have i was like you know i wonder if he's a bit sick of talking about the gift of injury or you know like all this back stuff but it is a fascinating story and uh, you know i even though it is you have done it on a few other podcasts so i still think you know i think it's just me selfishly i'm kind of seeing my favorite band and i just want to hear a few of the favorite songs but uh yeah anyway, just to, to touch on brian like sort of you know the how that came about and you know it doesn't have to be the the super long-winded ones you've done before but uh i just i just love the story and i think for anyone who hasn't heard it who's going to listen to this it's a phenomenal story I knew the name Brian Carroll just because of my work in athletics. He was a uh, very competitive power lifter, uh, had a lot of early success in his career, and had lifted phenomenal loads. I mean, he, he squatted over 1,000 pounds in competition more than 50 times. Wow. Anyway, he phoned me up and said, this is Brian Carroll, the power lifter calling from Florida. He says, I'm having a terrible time with my back. Can I come and see you? So that's how it all started. And uh, when he came to see me, he was in a bad way. He was in a dark place. And, uh, but, but quite quickly, I was able to point out to him uh, the mechanisms uh, of his pain. And, and Brian has, uh, and he wrote about this in the book. He said, uh, some guy had told him, go see McGill up in Canada. So obviously it was a big commitment for him to make. But he said, I, I promised myself I would humble myself and just listen to the guy, even though he thought he knew it all because obviously he's had such incredible athletic success. And when I pointed some of these things out to him and got him moving without pain very, very quickly, within a few minutes in in some simple tasks. Uh, I, I think he got it. And uh, uh, towards the end of that first session, which was about three hours long, uh, he said, okay, and once I'm out of pain, I, I want to train and, and get my world record back again. And I, I looked at him and I think, I, I believe I said something like, uh, Brian, if you were my son, my recommendation would be, if you get out of pain, this is a big injury. Uh, uh, my suggestion is just enjoy life. What, why tickle the dragon's tail? He says, no, no, I, I want that. And, you know, Robbie, you've heard, you've heard this time and time again. If you go to a, a world-class athlete and say, you can get the gold medal and you will live three more years, or you can get the bronze and you'll, you'll, you'll live a good life, you know what they'll choose. And I think there was a bit of uh, Brian coming through there. This very, I mean, what drove him to be a world champion is, is simply that. And so I said, well, 
you know, if, if we can get you out of pain, no promises, but I, from what I've seen today, I think we can do that. But uh, he says, no, I want the world record. And I said, well, if, if, if we can do that, we'll write a book together. And it was sort of an uh, uh, offhand comment. Well, you know how the story went. He got out of pain. We saw him again. We devised a plan. He was an absolute professional in executing. He rebuilt and remodeled his discs and vertebra and sacrum, which was absolutely necessary to do to withstand the kind of championship loads he needed. Uh, he did that for a year. The second year he spent regaining his strength and athleticism. The third and fourth years he won the Arnolds. So there you go. That's the story. And the book started out as Brian's story. But I found out, and, and you know, we've become best of friends uh, since that time. We really enjoyed each other's company. Yeah. The darn book turned into a, a manual for the back injured strength athlete. Yeah. Never anticipated that when we started the, the project. So it became a much bigger book than we ever <laughs> expected. <laughs> uh, There's one part of the story I loved, her, I, I loved hearing was kind of when Brian initially came and I think you were just kind of going through like some, you know, hip hinge and mechanics. And I think he was he just going with an empty bar and like he was just like sluggish with his form and all and you kind of, you know, called him out on it. And he was kind of saying like this, like that was at a point where he's like, you know, like Stu's right. Or even like how he was sitting, just even simple things like that. You know, he really, really had to go back to ground zero and humble himself. So um, I, I loved hearing that part as well, that you kind of had to call him out and say, listen, just because this is an empty bar and you've, you know, you have world records doesn't mean that this is beyond you. Like, yeah, no, I think I said, you treat that bar like it's 800 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. When you bend over and flush the toilet, treat that. <laughs> respect but you know it worked yeah absolutely and uh their um walking was a massive part of his rehab and i i it, that wasn't a surprise to me because i know from from in your previous texts as well um textbooks in in low back disorders i think you might have mentioned ultimate back fitness form so the, the power of walking for again context depends on the individual with the back pain but walking can be very um a, a great sort of uh, medication, if you want to say, for some people's back pain. And, and you, you use that as a strategy with Brian at the uh, initial phase as well. Could you maybe just tell people why, for some people with back pain, that walking is, is very, uh, has, has a great remedy about it? Robbie, you are incredibly good at what you do. Your ability to hone in on some of these things is, is fabulous. I, I need to start with a story. When you go to the neurology ward at the children's hospital, go find the young child who has a paralyzed quadratus lumborum. It's rare, but you'll find them. Now watch them walk. They uh, say the left QL is paralyzed. They can stand on their left leg, swing their right leg to take a step. But when they step on their right leg and swing their left leg, the pelvis falls off to the left because there's no QL to hold it up. That's the first part of the story, QL, is absolutely necessary to walk. Now, let's see, um, can you stand on one leg and do a knee circle with the free leg and go to the other side? That requires a little bit of spine stiffness and stability. And if you don't have that, you won't be playing sport, you won't be running, you won't even be walking well. So the lateral stabilizers, what's the number one? We've measured this, it's quadratus lumborum. Mm. Okay, so there's a little bit of the scientific foundation. Um, some people focus on uh, sagittal plane stability and core fitness, their back muscles and their front muscles. But what they will find is uh, if you're running on the rugby pitch and you plant the left leg and cut and turn to the right and you get a shot of back pain, you were frontal plane stability and control deficit. Oh, somewhere in your program, you forgot to walk. Carry weights suitcase style. Yeah. Carry weights in farmer's walk. It is such a cure. Go, go to exhaustion on a farmer's walk. What's aching? Your spine is swollen either side with massive quadratus lumborum challenge. So the, 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 the upshot of it all, to have a fit, stable spine, very able to be quick, fast, carry load 
push and pull, uh, you've got to have frontal plane stability and it starts with walking. The final bit is when we have a person with back pain, uh, I ask them, how far can you walk without pain? Oh, I can walk half an hour. Or, okay, I said, good, don't. Instead, let's walk 15 minutes three times a day. Every time you stick food in your mouth, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I, would, I need a 15-minute walk. Yeah. And that's where it starts. So there's a, an interval training exposure to guarantee success. So there's a lot to it. There's a lot of foundational science. That's, that's part of it. <laughs> but that will eventually, I, I can suggest all kinds of walking progressions after that. But, uh, it's and just, just one final thing with Brian's rehab. Did you have much of a say on his program design when he was coming back? Um, no. no. My, my job was to get him out of pain and okay. build the foundation for his body to bear heavy load. That was my job. Yeah. Well, Brian had already been world champion. He knew how to build strength. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just mean in terms of, because again, as we touched on earlier, sort of, you know, kind of bringing it more to his awareness about like the timelines he needed for recovery in between exposures to certain lo loading parameters. I was wondering. Yeah, no, I, I, well, of course, I assisted with that, but that was yeah. all in the beginning. That yeah. was to, yeah. to, to cause biological adaptation. Mm. But n no one's better at, at coaching and, and programming strength than, than, than Brian. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll put a plug in for this. We actually teach a course together now called the... Yeah of injury the, the first one uh, it'll be in columbus ohio at jail holdsworth's gym in uh, december the first good old jail good old jail oh, okay yeah. there's another mountain for you eh? <laughs> you can get a get jail to show you the rpr resets the he's, he's teaching that course at the moment yeah. um i have a few little just quick fire ones too if you have the time is that okay sure. no hey, robbie as i said i really enjoy you you're 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 very um uh What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, perceptive. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, lessons, Stu, since we last spoke six years ago, um, uh, what have been sort of the biggest lessons that you've taken away over the last number of years, if, if anything comes to mind? Well, uh, I'll, I'll bet if you asked your dad or your granddad, they'd all ask the same way. They'd all answer that the same way. And it's, it's just... Uh, you, you, you get wiser at uh, living life, executing life, and it's less about me and myself. Of course, when you're young, you know, look, you got to make money, you got to feed your kids. You, 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 do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, you got to scrap a little bit. That, that's all gone. Now it's all about just helping others. Am I leaving this situation better than I found it? Um, you know, you, you do a favor for somebody. And if you told me this 30 years ago, I wouldn't have believed you. But if you do a favor for someone in some way, shape or form, it gets repaid to you 10 times yeah. and a little bit, be kind, you know, you know, I, I, I think of the turmoil I've been through. Everybody's hurting just a little bit, yeah. you know, just, just be kind. Yeah. So I, I don't know if that's, what, what people are, are expecting. If we were talking about uh, being a good trainer, I would say keep working at becoming a master of the craft. Mm -hmm. Know the science, know the biology, know the psychology. Keep putting it together and then practice it. Get off Facebook and get out there and change a few people's lives. You'll make a few mistakes, no question, but you will converge on this level of mastery where you have much more success than failures. And, and changing people's lives is really what we're all supposed to be about. Anyway, that's a bit of a long-winded answer. But no, it's a, it's a great... Dad would answer that the same way. Yeah, yeah, it's a great answer. And as, as your father said, it's, uh, it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. You know, that that's comes through in spades and becomes more important every day. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Um, learnings do, how do you learn? So when you want to accumulate knowledge in a particular area, how do you go about that? Well, I've been lucky in that I always had the ability to be the primary investigator. So when we ran the lab and clinic, if I talked to someone and they asked me a question I said, well, I don't know. That's it. Good. I know what my next experiment is. We're going to design an experiment that will reveal the answer. 
we'll go make the equipment, we'll go find the people that this will affect and we'll run the experiment and then we'll see. So that's how I've always uh, found the big things that, you know, when people want to rent my mind, so an athlete or, or you in this or whatever, the information I give you came from that evidence foundation. That, 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 that's pretty much how I've yeah. l- learned. It was Brilliant. primary discovery. What, and, and this, when I ask this question, your answer can be anything. It doesn't have to just be limited to coaching or rehab. What would your top resource be to any listener um, that you think could facilitate them to have just a happier and, and better life? top resource so it could be a book or a video you saw a podcast a person a course uh, a, a just a piece of life advice oh boy uh, you know i don't know if i'm wise enough to answer such a <sighs> question yeah I, I i i don't know uh work every day to better your soul and, and try and be a better person yeah that includes, you know, self-betterment, keep trying to be, reach that level of mastery in, in, in your craft, whatever that chosen craft is, and uh, help a few others in uh, doing so. But, you know, I, I, I'm not that big wise man <laughs> to answer. Yeah, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're being pretty stoic today. It's, it's one sort of theme I've, I've sort of noticed with you on, a, on the last few podcasts I've listened that you've given over the last number of uh, maybe year, 18 months is that you you do seem to be in the headspace of being a little more reflective and stoic in, in where you are currently in your life i think you were I think on the, the my muscle project i think it was on that podcast you know you were you, you were kind of talking about some of some of these thoughts you were having about just like you know living a good life and just you know kind of trying to find fulfillment and happiness in yourself and sort of paying that energy forward and like obviously you're you're a, a more mature uh man than myself i won't call yourself old but uh i think as i get older too like i'm trying to appreciate that you know, kind of working on your, on your, on yourself in terms of self actualization, self actualization is, is very, very important. And, uh, you know, that, uh, you, you kind of spoke earlier on that, you know, you have your turmoil. I mean, we all have our demons and, and we all have, uh, our ways of dealing with that on a daily basis, month month basis. But, um, I always mention these three, three individual men, uh, who've had a huge influence on me. I say it in a lot of my podcasts, but, uh, a guy called Joseph Shields and Pierce, another gentleman called Jock Fresco and another gentleman called Bruce Lipton. And, uh, Joseph Shields and Pierce and Fresco passed away, but their Shields and Pierce's writings were were very influential on me. And Fresco was a um, a guy behind the Venus Project. I just watched a lot of videos he'd done. And then Bruce Lipton has a fabulous book called Biology Belief. But what what they brought to my awareness too, and I'll bring this full circle, is um, you know that like the environment is huge in shaping an organism, and and obviously with us humans, you know the environment is massive in 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 how it shapes us. But I guess was a key thing that separates us is that we we can choose to perceive our environment. But through their work, what they really made me made me appreciate was that everyone and everything is the way they are for a reason, and that that appreciation and awareness allowed me to start to develop more levels of compassion and empathy and understanding and discernment, and to realize that I'm I am the way I'm for certain reasons too that I was oblivious to before I was brought to this awareness about, you know, environments and organism interactions. And so all I try to do on a daily basis is just to be a better version of myself moment to moment. And as Gandhi said, kind of be the change you want to see in the world. So that's a sense I'm kind of getting from you and a few of the podcasts I listened over the last year, 18 months you've done that. You just seem to be sort of at a stage in life where you're just about like trying to be a good person and get back and realizing that, you know, we're all just in this journey of life together and, and how we attain fulfillment is just through different means for you. It was, the spinal research and the talking and speaking for other people it's true being a poet or a musician or a chef or a teacher or you know sort of how we find our fulfillment and happiness or heaven on earth is through different means so uh it sort of it just stri- strikes me that's kind of where your headspace has been too have you just been doing a lot of reading around that is it just that you're getting older and seeing kids or the grandkids or the family sort of getting older is is that kind of where you've been lately uh, I should, that was a brilliant answer, by the way. I should be interviewing you. I, <laughs> I don't know what's driving it other than, uh, you know, when I was at the university, it was go, go, go. I was on 10-minute appointments. And then, you know, oh, I got to travel to Germany to give a speech tomorrow. Okay, bang, yeah. yeah. You know, got to get my head into that. I, I never was able to tone it back. I was never allowed to uh, running the operations that we ran. So maybe it's just simply a, a function of, uh, you know, I have time to stop and talk to people and share a laugh. And, uh, 
you know, uh, getting it done by tomorrow, uh, it, it isn't so important for me now. I, yeah, yeah. I don't have those heavy travel commitments. And you, you actually have the time to sit down and reflect. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I, I, I've, it's, it's fabulous to be able to spend time with my wife. Uh, yeah. She's a, a competitive master's athlete now. She happens to be a rower. In fact, on Monday, I'm driving her down to Sarasota, which is uh, 2,400 kilometers one way. <laughs> so for, for, you might as well drive to Moscow. I think that might be even closer for you. But nonetheless, why I'm saying that is I'm her boat boy and water boy. That's all I am. Yeah. It's fabulous. Yeah. I'm delighted. I'm delighted for you to hear that. Uh, just one or two more, Sue, and I'll, I'll let you go because uh, it's, as you can see uh, on our, the, the listeners won't see this, but you can see it on our video here. That it's, it's getting dark. I actually don't keep light bulbs in my house. I'm, I'm a circadian biology freak. So that's why, if you're wondering, why is you not turn the lights on? Because I actually don't have any artificial light. <laughs> um, your top books do. What, if, if you were to give one book away, so actually it's a double question. What are you currently reading, if you are reading anything, and what, what would your top book be as well? So your current and top books. I build boats now. So my, the book I'm reading is on naval architecture. Yeah. I like it. I like it. I love it. <laughs> okay. But, you know, uh, what, what, what people do, I, I have to respect a person before I consider their... Now, there's too much these days of people just giving opinions without a good foundation. Mm. So with, with that background... Um, and and I'll try and keep it to our training world, I guess. Yeah. About, uh, Michael Shacklock and neurodynamics. Very good. Uh, if you understand how the nerves move and cause pain through mechanical compression and tension, uh, you learn how to position the body in your client to take a pain out of a specific exercise. And... Uh, anyway there there would be one that uh i've, I've known my, M michael and his work for a long time but mm -hmm. i just happened to pick up that out of my own library the other day and thumb through it again and damn it's beautiful stuff well, to talk about people and strength uh, well you know bill kazmaier world's strongest man he wrote the uh forward for our book back mechanic but <laughs> to and bill hasn't written much but to just to speak with him in person is just an absolute it doesn't get any better than that yeah. to to hang out uh with pavel satsulin mm. the uh, strong first kettlebell master and just discuss physiology mechanics and strength he's like just disappeared oh, <laughs> i know I, I know he lives down in santa monica but like he just he's, he's off the grid Oh, he's busy. Yeah. He's, he's not up, off the grid at all. He's doing wonderful uh, stuff, still doing strength investigations. And he runs his courses. I knew he, he's coming to Europe tomorrow, I think. Oh, too. is he? I almost checked that oh. out. Oh, but yeah. it, it's funny you mentioned Bill Kazmaier because I, I know Ken Kanakin from Swiss, from Swiss, who I know you know. And Ken was saying that uh, he was trying to get Bill for ages to go to Swiss. Like, and then he was like, nobody knew where he was for ages. They were like, where is he? Where is he living? And he eventually said he found him up in Alaska or somewhere like that. He was living up there and working. In oh, yeah. No, Bill lives in Alaska. In yeah. fact, well, I won't say what his email is. <laughs> that will give it away. But, uh, yeah, he, he, yeah, he's a fabulous personality. And as you know, he travels a lot still. Yeah, yeah. The shows. I ran into Joel Jameson in uh, new york uh, a few yeah, months yeah you did a, a weekend with pat pat davis and i know joel and pat extremely well i've met i've i've spent three I've, I've met up with joel three times in person and i've met pat in person too i actually interviewed pat an awful lot in the podcast but myself and joel would interact an awful lot two great guys yeah and and joel i found him absolutely fascinating and there's a guy who you know he knows a lot of the science mm. on uh you know, some people, they just overtrain and beat themselves to pieces, not realizing that their window to create the adaptations from the training is limited. Yeah. 
And uh, I think he's really dialing that in. And what's the proof of the pudding? The number of guys he's got number one in the UFC. So, you know, that's his, his niche. And uh, I, I can tell you with, with my work with some of the fighters, it is an enormous challenge because, you know, there's an athlete that needs mobility, stability, mental toughness, endurance, explosive power. I mean, they're mutually exclusive. It's hard to have an athlete with a high VO2 max that can still be explosive. You know, they're, they're fighting metabolisms and somehow you've got to, uh, uh, hone and tune these athletes. So they're some of the biggest challenges I have, but uh, Joel does very, very well with their, uh, uh, programming, uh, and fitness, as he would call it. Um, Tim Gabbett, the Australian, is is another one who uh, is is very good at um, knowing uh, where the tipping point is in increasing training load. Yeah. So people get hurt when they increase the training load in too large a step. They get greedy, or worse yet. You add that with a little bit of a flaw in training form, and all of a sudden the tissue stresses with a step input cross the tipping point, and now we've got you know real micro failure going on, and uh, uh, they've, they've lost their train that particular training cycle, or worse, yeah. sometimes they'll lose their career. So anyway, th- th- those are just a few people that just off the top of my head have a good scientific foundation plus the credibility and validity from doing it and creating some winners. Mm, great stuff, great stuff. And I just want to put it out there, Joel's a, a resource or brilliant. So he has a certified conditioning course, which is phenomenal in terms, again, solid scientific foundations behind it. And he also has a fabulous uh, heart rate variability course. And he brought out a new product there recently, Morpheus, which is all about like recovery. But uh, yeah, he's a, he's a very intelligent guy. So he is as well. Um, my, my wife uses Morpheus, just so you know. She's, oh, does she? That's brilliant. And just to tell you, she's she's no slouch. She's a North American pairs women's rowing champ. Uh, yeah. So you know she. Uh, but uh, no, that that uh, helps her training. Uh, did, uh, did, did 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 Joel did Joel say if you're ever in Seattle, he'll bring you up on the helicopter? Ah, uh-huh, yes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> he's bad for that he's bad apparently he brought Mike Robertson up and Mike Robertson was like shitting and he was like Mike Robertson doesn't like helicopters but it's also too because Joel, Joel always like uh, he messes around with people so he's like now, just so you know like you know I've only been in the helicopter for a while I, I do planes more and, you know helicopters are more likely to crash but we should be okay he does all this with people and then people are like uh. <laughs> he's only messing with them like oh yeah He's gas. He's hilarious. So, Stu, last two, I really want to uh, hear your answers for these. Lo- I'd love to hear your answers for these ones. So, Elon Musk has uh, ha- has managed to get people off, uh, managed to get people to, to leave Earth if they so choose. And for whatever reason, you're like, you know what, I think I'm going to spend one more year on Earth and then I'll, I'll give it a blast out in space. So, my question is, you have one more year left on planet Earth. How would you spend that year and why? I'm not changing my answer uh, from before. If I died tomorrow or someone said I was going to die tomorrow, you know what I would say, Robbie? I, I've, I'm i perfectly satisfied. I don't need to do anything myself. My mm. kids are grown. They're good people. They're on their way. I'm very proud of them. Uh, uh, but if you just gave me another year, I, I could just hope I could just be a better friend and uh, lend a hand and that's as good Brilliant. now as it gets and I'm sorry I wish I could be more no that's an answer. that's the exact answer I thought you were going to give and it's a beautiful answer and all I ever really want is just honesty from people so that's a beautiful honest answer sorry I actually like because one question came into my mind and it's a real quick one too uh, now that you're retired do you still uh, keep up to date with any research and also was there any particular area of research you, you didn't get to do that you would still love to do or have done? Um, well, of course, the answer is yes. I still get asked uh, questions that I don't know the answer to. And I think, you know, if I had the lab back, I, I would know the answer in a year. Just give me a year and I, I, I could answer that. So, of course, there's, there's always uh, those kinds of things. But uh, is there any any particular one that because maybe there is someone who's listened to this who is researching in backs and they might say, oh, I'll, I'll get into this and contact Stu and say, listen, I can do this in my lab. And 
you know, maybe just ask for his guidance towards or while I'm doing it? Well, let me make this just a little bit of a bigger answer then since you pose the question that way. Rather than diving down, because when I say I don't know something, I, I, I'm going to be arrogant and say I think I have a pretty good yeah. understanding of the big influences of low back pain. Yeah. I'm not really the world's expert when it comes to the neck. So if, if, if a young person were to come to me just tabula rasa and say, where's the opportunity? And they say, well, well, do what I did, but do it in the neck. And that is understand uh, the mechanics, the physiology, the neuroscience, the psychology, uh, and then really yeah. start to solve some of these issues. Because I've tried some lumbar mechanics and interventions on the cervical spine, and, and we all know it's different. Uh, it's it's much thinner. It's much more mobile. It's much less load bearing. Uh, totally different facet angles and shear support, uh, etc. So uh, and and also in the uh, lumbar spine, all the nerves are in the dura, and and there is. Uh, if you move the spine a certain way, and Michael Shacklock will back this up, it pulls and drags the nerves certain ways. So it allows you to diagnose and, and really figure out, you know, why your right toe buzzes when you look up, for example. But the, the neck, the, the spinal cord as it travels through the neck, does not have uh, connections, ligamentous connections or connections to the jury. It just sort of hangs and free flows. And thank goodness um, it does. Uh, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I got that backwards. You've got the ligaments holding the... Uh, the uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I was going to say, because when you said, thank God it does, I was like, does he mean that? Does that no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 know, I, I, know, I know what you're saying. A brain fart there. So now, uh, w w you know, this is why you can whiplash a neck and, and really traumatize the cord. It's kind of hard to whiplash a lumbar nerve, mm. uh, for, for example, because it's just free flowing. So, um, uh, but, but anyway, to figure out those, those drags and viscous things and, and some of the connections and, and how to really assess it. Um, you know, Michael obviously would have a, a much better uh, idea of all of that. But I, I think for someone to really become a, a full master of neck mechanics is a, okay. is a potential that... Uh, very, very last one. I, I'm in, uh, uh, I'm in around your neighborhood and uh, <laughs> that's kind of sounded a bit creepy. I'm in your neighborhood, but uh, I'm, I'm knocking about the neighborhood and I say, Stuart, let's take you for dinner and, and your wife. And you can invite five people to this dinner and these people can be dead or alive. Who would you bring to this dinner and why? Muhammad Ali, okay. Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee. Uh, probably Einstein, probably Jesus and Gandhi. How about that for five? That's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's not 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 a hundred miles off my own one too, yeah. So it's pretty good. <laughs> Mike, my, my, my I'm gonna ask you something. Who would your five be? Well, like I all say to people, listen, it, it it'll probably change like on a day to day or month to month basis, kind of depending on where you're reading and you know what's on your mindset. But I think at the moment, anyway, Joseph Shields and Pierce, who I mentioned earlier on, because his writings were were profound to me. Um, uh, Jock Fresco, I think, would be there. Martin Luther King. Um, Lincoln and um, I actually said Paul Check last time but I think maybe Nelson Mandela might sneak in there so you know I'd have to make a decision on that so I'd probably go with uh, Joseph Chilton Pierce, Jock Fresco uh, Martin Luther King Abraham Lincoln and probably uh, Nelson Mandela Very good yeah. You know I, I, I might add to that list my own father I have so many questions for him now. When I was a kid, he, you know, because I, I used to train very heavy as a, as a teenager. And uh, he would say things to me, uh, you know, uh, that, that's probably not the wise way to do that, or you're overtraining this or whatever. And, you know, he died young, but I, I wish I, I, I'd love to go back to him now and say, how did you know all that? Because what you were telling me when I was 15 had a lot of wisdom to it. So I wonder how a fellow like him gained all that. Yeah. No idea. Anyway, there's just a thought that came to mind when uh, 
you said that. It's it's fun to kind of know where where your 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 means yeah. come from a little bit. I, uh, and the reason I know that too is because I've asked a lot of people this question, and they they get. I can almost see they almost like it's like they have a fear of answering the question because like it's like oh what if I don't give a profound five people or the right five people or if I leave someone out and I'm like, listen. Your your five people to this dinner would change if I asked you tomorrow or next week or next month because you're yeah. you're you're a different person on a moment to moment basis. So like I, I, I mean, if I read a JFK biography like because I've read JFK biography, like you'd be like, oh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy being that five now because he's just top of mind awareness. So it's just uh, yeah, and just I think I always tell people there's no right or wrong with your answer. You know, no, no one said like this is the only answer you can ever give, and this is it because it's on a podcast now and it's been on the internet forever. So. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that answer. And uh, that's all I have for you today, Stu. And man, uh, this uh, conversation completely exceeded my expectations. Um, not, 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 that I, not that I had low expectations, but uh, it, uh, it actually got into nearly every area that I, I kind of always wanted to talk to you about, you know, in terms of not even just sort of our professional field, but even just some life stuff. So I really, truly appreciate, appreciate you making time for me today. Very great. Oh, fabulous. Well, Robbie, you know, you've, you've brought out a few things in me today that uh, rarely come out. So I, I thank you for your thoughtfulness and uh, uh, your, um, now what was the word I use? Your perceptiveness. Perceptiveness. I, perceptiveness. I like that. Yeah. I like that. So th- thanks so much. And, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll just wrap up the show and I'll say goodbye to you offline. So um, just for everyone listening, thanks so much. Everything will be in the show notes. Everything to do with Stu's websites, courses, his books. Make sure you check that out. I think I have everything that Stu ever had in terms of books and DVDs. So um, Stu, I, I, just from our profession too, thanks for everything you've done. And you've been a huge influence on me and no doubt many of the listeners. Thanks. I, I appreciate that very much, Robbie. Thank you, sir. Thank all right. you for all that you do. In <laughs> Thank you. Okay, guys, take care, and I'll talk to everyone soon.